can't tell you how much and how delighted I am not only to have you here, but more importantly to have John Coliano with us. If you've had a chance to, with any of you, read his, his biography, it is an amazing story, beginning, obviously, as a, as a young child, his dad was concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. That's kind of where his musical roots came. But uh, I've read just a number of quotes, and I think you probably have read them as well, but the one to me, uh, and just talking with John, he's kind of moving away from that, but he truly is the major symphonist, if you will, of the 20th century. I don't think there's any any argument with that. His work with uh, Chicago Symphony, Symphony One, which is one of my favorites, and uh, just amazing things. So we're truly lucky to have John here, and I can tell you a little bit of the background of what got him here originally. Many of you may know one of our alums, Peggy Manastra, who works at G. Sherman. And uh, shortly after the storm last year, while we were preparing to come back for the second term after the hurricane, I called Peggy and I said, you know, it would really be wonderful if you could maybe help us with any of your artists that you have to come down to be with our students. I said, it will be very important for them to reconnect with this institution. And for many of you that are freshmen, you never really attended. You came for a day and left and were evacuated. So uh, John graciously agreed to come. Uh, we couldn't quite work schedules in the spring. Things got a little hectic, and then we got that spring two thing and all of that that went on with that. So, happen as it may be, John was able to come down with the LPO to do uh, the uh, clarinet uh, work that we're going to hear today with uh, Sam Drucker from the uh, uh, New York Philharmonic, and the schedule's worked out, so he has graciously agreed to be with us today, and so please welcome, truthfully an amazing person, John. <laughs> Instead of writing a few bars of music and then saying, what does that need to be with, and writing a few more bars and perhaps another few bars, what would it be like for me to somehow plan a piece of 30-something minutes or an opera of two and a half hours and actually build the piece first as if it were a building and then find the music for it? And I started doing that and it became very interesting to me because, because I built this building, and you know many people talk about uh, music as architecture in the dimension of time. If you think of it that way, when we build a piece, there are things about architecture and about art and music that have very much the same thing. When you design a building, you want certain things to repeat and you want other things to be different. And the scaling of that is what makes a great architect. If you look at the Capitol building in Washington, you're really seeing what we in music call turn to reform. You're seeing A, the dome is B, and the return is to A. And that's the balance that makes that work. 
Well, we've been using traditional forms since Haydn developed them way back in the 1700s. And very often, writing in those forms solves that problem. But to me, the most exciting part about a piece is what happens if you just say, I need to write a piece, and then you say, now what shape can this be? Uh, we also have to realize that today there are no rules, quite severely and importantly, no rules about composing. In the Baroque period, in the classical period, in the Romantic period, and even 12-tone music, they all have rules. And if you learn rules, you can start in composing. But today, I mean, quite honestly, I can say this is the beginning of a piece, or this is the beginning of a piece, or this is the beginning of a piece. Silence. All of those are correct. There, nobody can say that's wrong. It's what you do with that that matters. So the way I write music, and I've been doing this for a while, is I try to pinpoint all the things that I want to happen and the reason I want to write that piece and almost type it out and write it out and understand why I'm writing that piece. Then I build the whole shape of that piece. And then after it's built, when I built, I will show you what I mean in a few minutes. After it's built, then I look for the material for that building that I've already designed. I don't think you'd find an architect, or, uh, architect designing the cornice of a building without knowing what the building is. That comes later. And I don't think you'd find a sculptor sculpting out a finger and saying, I wonder who that's attached to, and then keep mm -hmm. sculpting. They know mm -hmm. what's inside that block through many sketches. Uh, and yet, so often in music, we find that someone is composing a little part of something and then really doesn't know what's going to happen next. Uh, I try to answer those questions the best I can beforehand and actually draw it on pages of music or pages of page without, just pages like that, blank pages, where I will draw shapes and returns of ideas, etc. So this is how this piece got written. This clarinet concerto um, was written in, for 1977 premiere, so it was written during 1966. And uh, the interesting thing about the piece for me, well, I had a lot of very strong emotions that made me want to do something special in this piece. The following emotions was first, actually. My father was the concert master, as it was remarked, of the New York Philharmonic for my entire life. Life When I was a child, at, you know, I used to watch him go to Carnegie Hall and play concertos and work with the orchestra and met Tuscany and Bruno Walter and all those great conductors. As I grew up, I went on tour with the orchestra and actually knew them personally because my father was the concert master so that I went on the European tour with them and knew the timpanists and who they were and what their friends were and who liked whom and who didn't like whom, etc. just like you do with the people you know. And so then in 1976, I got this call commissioning me to write a piece for them. Now, I was a composer then. I had written music. I had sent it to the Philharmonic and other people, but the Philharmonic had never played a piece of mine. So to begin, it was very important to me that the orchestra I grew up with was playing this piece. My father, who had retired from the Philharmonic um, in the late 60s, died a year before. And when I got the commission, he had been dead less than a year, and I thought, I mean writing a piece for the orchestra, not only I grew up with, but in a sense for my father, who was the concert master of that orchestra. Something has to happen to this piece that in some way lets me speak about that. And the soloist was Stanley Drucker. Um, many, many years earlier, when I was in high school, I took two clarinet lessons with Stanley, and then my clarinet was stolen out of my high school gym locker, and I wasn't very adventurous, so I never Got to do it. <laughs> but nevertheless, I always knew that Stanley Drucker, who became first clarinet of the New York Philharmonic at the age of 18, and is still the first clarinetist right now of the New York Philharmonic, playing just as amazingly, uh, has done that for well over 50 years. Uh, he is the ultimate virtuoso. And the conductor was to be Leonard Bernstein. And that meant a lot to me, first of all, because I think Bernstein was such a great man, and I so admired his music and his conducting and his speaking to people, but practically speaking also, I worked with him for 13 years on the Young People's Concerts, this whole series on CBS television. You can now get uh, video discs of. And I worked with him on the scripts, with him and Mary Rogers, Richard Rogers' daughter, and his assistant, and the director and his assistant. We worked on the scripts with him the week before the telecast, 
And then I worked with the cameras and the camera shots during the telecasts, which were at a certain point live and then became taped later on. So I had all of these feelings of what am I going to do with this piece, with all these people I care about, the loss of my father, uh, the first piece played by the orchestra I grew up with, and Leonard Bernstein conducting it. Um, and that was what I stood around with for a while. And I came to some conclusions first. And this, again, is the big piece conclusion. I felt that the show had to have a central movement. And that that central movement um, had to be an elegy in memory of my father. Now, since he was the concertmaster, I said to myself, what I really need is a, a very lyrical, almost desolate movement for personal reasons, and a movement in which the solo violin was very predominant. The concert master is the first violinist, and he plays all the solos. So in the second movement, there's an extended solo with the concert master playing, and then a duet with the solo clarinetist. And that was the first impulse I had. So now I knew I was going to have a slow movement that concerned the sense of loss of losing your father and also the idea that the person who was playing in that seat was your father, because that's where he was all those years. The next thing was Stanley. Um, Stanley was so famous as having the greatest fingers in the history of the instrument. He was a super virtuoso of virtuosi. And I said to myself, what would happen if I wrote him a movement that I entitled Cadenzas? And the movement is basically about the cadenza. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with the cadenza, it's a passage in the concerto in which the orchestra stops playing, and the soloist plays and shows his or her virtuosity. And um, sometimes it's written down, and the early days it used to be improvised. But it's a very free passage for the soloist to show what, what they can do. So I thought, what would happen if I had a piece in which the He's opened with a cadenza for the soloist, playing wildly and very softly. And then after that cadenza, the orchestra and the soloist played this kind of interlude leading to the second cadenza, which would be like the first cadenza, except when the first cadenza was all soft and very whispery, the second cadenza was wild and energetic. And then I said, I really don't have to leave the orchestra out of these cadenzas, but I don't want the soloist to be inhibited by having to even worry about the orchestra. So I developed a notation in this piece in which there are cues for the conductor to cue and wait for the, the soloist to do something and cue at the next one and cue at the next one. And percussionists and other instruments can come in on those cues, but the soloist doesn't have any beat time he has to worry about. He just plays. So that was the idea of the structure of that. Now I had the first movement, which would be these cadenzas. I had the second movement, which would be an elegy. And now in the final movement, uh, this was a very interesting problem for me. I wanted to have, because I knew the neo Philharmonic, every single person in the orchestra play in the concerto. It's a, like a 104-piece orchestra. Uh, one doesn't tend to do that in a concerto because you'll swallow your soloist with too much sound. On the other hand, emotionally, I thought, I want everybody to play. And not only that, but I want every single person, including the string players, to play a little tiny solo at one point, even if it's one note, just because I know the orchestra. Now, this is a, an irrational decision. I just made this decision because I wanted to. It's kind of crazy. And I thought, well, OK, but I'm going to do it, just because I feel that way about this orchestra. And it's my first rhythm ever. So I had to figure that out. I said, well, what I can do to be just a little more practical is take out, in terms of playing, some of the instruments, that is, not have everybody play through the whole concerto, but maybe save some of the players for the last five minutes, say, and then let them play so that everybody does play, but not through the entire three movements. And I thought, well, let me, uh, let me see what I can do. The, there's one, there are three clarinets in the major symphony orchestra and a bass clarinet. The bass clarinet's no problem, it's down below. But the other two clarinets might get in the way of the soloist in terms of the hearing, because they sound exactly the same. They won't play to me. <laughs> Now, my brass are my loudest problem. Uh, the trumpets have, there are four you know, trumpets in the New York Philharmonic. Why don't I cancel out two until near the end and just have two play? That'll cut the trumpet sound in half for the soloist. Then I thought the French horns, well, the New York Philharmonic has six French horns, as do the big major orchestras. 
that really can get in the way of a soloist. And I only need the French horn melodically, perhaps. I can use other brass lower to do these other stuff. So let me take five French horns and not use them at all until the last five minutes. So I subtracted those players, and I say, okay, now this is what I have, so that means for the first movement, and for the second movement, and for part of the third movement, these players are just gonna sit there. And that led me to think, and again, it isn't the kind of thinking that happens in a 10 minute period. It's the kind of thinking that happens over weeks and weeks of mulling this over and writing it down. But it, it occurred to me then, okay, if these players are not going to play until the last five minutes, why do they have to sit in the chairs not playing all that time? It will be distracting and they're gonna get bored and I can use them, maybe can I use them someplace else? And then the idea occurred to me, well, what would happen if I took those players and I put them all around the hall, in back of the audience and other places so that when they came in, it was actually dealing with quadraphonic sound, let's say, the idea of space and sound not just left and right, but all around. And I like that idea a lot. And I thought about it, and then I said, let me then, before I write this piece, let me design where the players are gonna sit and how they're gonna react. From that, I drew, and I'll show you, this is the drawing of the original drawing, which is in the, in the music. So I'll just try and draw this rather rapidly for you. But you see, this is the stage at, and this is the hall, okay? So my thought was, okay, here's the stage. And here's the hall, which has various shapes. But I was thinking at that particular time of Avery Fisher Hall, because that's where the Philharmonic were playing. So I use that as my standard, in other halls we make little adjustments. And I said, okay, now I've got two clarinets, I've got uh, two trumpets, I've got five horns put there. So what I ended up doing and thought about it was, okay, let me take the, t the five horns first. Where do I put five horns? Well, I could go one, two, three, four, five. In other words, they ring the audience. And you know, in Avery Fisher Hall, they have the first boxes. There's the orchestra level and the first boxes. So I said, okay, why don't I put those in the first boxes? That way they could play, and it would, the orchestra's here, and the sound would be coming from different points, like from the left, the right, from the back, to the, the audience. And then I said, okay, that takes care of my horns. Now my trumpets, well, what would happen if I put them together and put them on the next tier of boxes, way in the back here? So, instead of putting them apart, I put them together, second tier. And that took care of them, and I said, now, they're in the center, they're all the way around, I probably need a hard left and a hard right. What would happen if I went to the very top of the hall where they have the score reading desks there's an Avery Fisher, they have in the very top here, they have some desks for score reading. So students can come and put their scores down and look at them here. So what if I put them all the way up there, on the very top of the hall? So I put a clarinet here and a clarinet there. Okay, this is mostly clarinet. Left and right rear. Uh, this is still not, no music has been written yet. Uh, but this is going to change things because what it means is that when I'm in the first movement and the second movement, I don't have a second horn or a third horn. 
I don't have another clarinet. I, don't, I have two trumpets, but I don't have any more. So I have to know this before I write the piece. Otherwise, I'd write the piece, and then I'd be stuck and have to go back and rewrite the whole piece without it. <laughs> so this kind of planning is important for that kind of reason, too. OK, so then I said, all right, that's terrific. Now I can do things all the way going left. I could probably have a note start here, and play here, here, and here, and here, and move that way. I could have people play here on this side and that side, back and forth. I could have people play from here to the trumpets on the stage, so they could call back and forth this way, right? So that gave me the idea. Well, if they could call back and forth, let's say I have the trumpets here, play da 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 then go da 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 if they can do that, I can do other things on the stage. So why don't I now see if I can make things move on the stage in the planning. So this is what I decided to do. First of all, timpani. There's a set of timpani on one side, and I put another set on the other side. So it's going to be left and right timpani. They could play, they could answer, they could play, they could answer. Okay. My trumpets are in the usual position here, but usually the trombones and the tubas are right next to them. What happens if I take the trumpets and put them there and put the put the trombones and the tuba and the tuba put them on this side, left and right, so the players can go this way and back and forth to the soloist. Now I've got Choirs on the back of the hall, this side, the back of the stage, this side, and this side, and the soloist in the center, and I've got the same thing out there. Then what would happen if I took all the strings, the cello sit here, <coughs> the viola sit here, the second violin sit here, and the first violin sit here? What would happen if I numbered the stands? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, five, six, seven. By a stand, I mean two chairs with a music stand. So it's two people are in a stand. That's how they sit. And the strings do that so that one can turn the page while the other one plays. Because the strings sometimes play so much that they play right through page turns. So for years and years, it's been while you get one flutist with one stand, another one with another one, this is two two players to a stand. So two players are on this. That means I could begin, say, a single note here, like a G. I could move it to here, and move it to here, and slowly move it from here to here by changing the stands. Mm -hmm. I could also take it from the center and move it this way, or move it this way, or move it this way. And this became very interesting to me. So I got all that done, and then, went back to the first movement and started thinking about it. Now, I've got a different orchestra because I've got my brass divided, trumpets here, trombones here. I've got less than the full orchestra here. And I'd be writing the first movement, uh, which, as, as, as I mentioned, has to do with the cadenzas. So, going back now, I'm going to raise the first one, put this here. One, to be named. Now, I had to pick a name. I knew the elegy was the elegy. I knew cadenzas was cadenzas. What was this going to be called? Well, the first thing I wanted was a name that described the idea of sound from various directions. Antiphonal. That was the first part. Does everybody know sort of what antiphonal means? Antiphonal is like in the old days with Gabrielli, they had these, this church, San Marco church, that had two um, um, stalls for the chorus on the left and the right. He would write music with the left sang, and then the right sang, and then they both sang, and vice versa. And he got all sorts of combinations of left and right. Antiphonal music comes from different directions, and very often calls to each other. That was the first part. Now, I still <laughs> haven't written the piece, but I'm deciding what will the clarinet do here if it can't be antiphonal itself. It has to have some thematic material. What kind of thematic material will I give this clarinet for the last movement? And the process there was, well, if I give the clarinet in the first movement 
these unmeasured, very, very rapid notes, like that, then what I can say for the clarinet of the last one is like a um, motor jack, almost like a motor going, which would give me a very strict, even pulse. There was a reason I wanted to do that, and that is the following. The clarinet, when it plays syncopations, if it does syncopations, always sounds like jazz. And I love jazz, but it's a very strong broth jazz. It's very, very strong. Uh, Copeland said formally, he was said in, in a book of his, that he had to give up writing the jazz influence pieces he did because it would, the influence was so strong that all the pieces became jazz pieces. Instead, what he did was he used the um, kind of rhythmic impulse of the jazz and the a harmonic thing, world of jazz and the bending of tones in his concert music. That is, he, he didn't use it consciously. Consciously, he did not use it after a certain point. And I felt that if I have repeated notes like this machine gun fire, that will not be the syncopated things that jazz has, and I will not tip this over into a jazz concerto last movement, which a lot of clarinet concertos are, I might add, like 80% of them. Sort of like the guitar, which automatically sounds Spanish if you strum it, and I had to work when I did my guitar concerto to figure a way that I didn't write a Spanish concerto because that meant it was a genre of Spanish concerto and I didn't want to just do that. So in this case, I said if they just repeat the notes, the term for that is toccata. Toccata comes from a keyboard technique, meaning toccare, to touch. It's a repeated note figure. Da, 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 da. So if I have an antiphonal toccata, I know my soloist can play toccata music, that is repeated note music, and will get me out of that, and then the antiphonal stuff will all be around that. So now I have my titles, I had a map, and I'm ready to begin my first movement. Now, considering time, I'm gonna play you little bits of some of the movements. Uh, if you can, this is really a piece to hear live, I must be honest with you. Uh, it's, even in surround sound recording, which barely exists now, this probably wouldn't work as, as it can live. Because when you hear things around you that way in, in the live space, it's quite extraordinary. So if you can make it to go, it's a good idea Saturday, uh, since they're doing it here, to go. It's not the perfect hall, because as you know, it's, it's really a convention center. So it doesn't have any bloom or echo that one would like. But it is very clear, and you will hear the, uh, the especially the last movement, in a way that you can't possibly hear now. So now comes the first movement. I decided, as I told you, to do, to do this cadenza passage and to have the cadenza be very soft. And because it was so soft and whispery, I called it ignus fatus, which is the will of the wisp in Latin. The will of the wisp are faint marsh gases that just sort of like little spurts appear. If you look into a marsh, you see little phosphorescent gases, and they disappear. So this is like the sound of the clarinet sort of comes out of nothing, back of nothing, and so forth. It plays very fast. And so, the first page of this music, again, I don't have a projector here, I'd show you, is this is the first breath. You see, it's like 128 notes, and it's the first breath. And in this cadenza, what I do is I write all those notes, and I put a little slash up here. You know what a grace note is with grace note slashes? But I put it on 128 notes, which means play them as fast as possible. So this cadenza, the soloist plays as fast as possible. Different people play it at different speeds. Stanley plays it at an astronomical speed. And this is, these three are his first breath. Then he, the flutes come in after he does this, and then he continues moving this way. I can play you this cadenza, and I think you can see it isn't the cadenza about beats, like one, two, three, four. It's a cadenza about fluttering about, flying in almost darkness because it's so soft. Um, and then I'll play it up to when the orchestra comes in.
notes of that run, but it's playing them very slowly on top of each other. into this interlude, joins in, and slowly pulling the orchestra faster and faster and faster and faster and wilder and wilder until we get to the second cadenza. And the second cadenza has the same kind of music as the first cadenza, excepting that it is amplified to fortississimo and it is joined with by the percussion. So you have the same run as you did before and the same opening music there, but now we have, if you can see the pages, all sorts of outbursts by the percussion against this cadenza. And this is the corona of the sun. This is the, the huge version of that tiny little section. I'll try and find it for you here, and fast forward to it, and just let you hear the beginning of that. So you can hear it really is the same music, but transformed. So you can hear that as the wild version of the earlier one, and it reaches a huge peak, and the orchestra comes in, and then it all plays the opening part actually backwards until it ends just a backwards right to the first note of the piece is the last note of the first movement. Now, the second movement is a completely different thing. After all that frenetic wildness, which we needed to show the virtuosity of the soloist in the cadenzas, now is the elegy. And uh, the elegy is, as I said, rather desolate. In fact, the word desolate is used to describe it to the players. Um, this is partly because I, you know, knowing my father, he was a very lonely man. He separated from my mother. He lived in a hotel. He only wanted to play music. He didn't have many friends, um, didn't read a book, do anything else but practice and play. Concertos, symphonic works, chamber music, he was there playing. Aside from that, he went out alone in a restaurant. And so the beginning of this movement, I think if you'll hear it, it's, it's, it's not just a sadness, but it's also a feeling of emptiness uh, because he kind of had that in his life. When he wanted to be warm to me, uh, I would visit because I lived more with my mother in Brooklyn, but I would visit him and he would... Um, play a piece he was working on. He'd say, look, I'm working on this, listen to this. And he'd play me sections and say, do you like this better or do you like this better? And that was the way he was close. So the movement has that kind of feeling. And it begins with the strings very quietly and then the solo clarinet. I'll just play you the beginning of it.
can see the, the mood that creates and how different it is in the first. Let me skip ahead a little bit and see if I can get the violin solo in mixed with it so you can hear then what happens when the two of them speak to each other. And then they proceed to play together for a while, and the violin, solo violin and the clarinet play the last phrase at the end of the movement. Um, interestingly, that's the part I wrote first in the whole concerto. After I designed all this, I went to the elegy and wrote the duet of the violin and the clarinet, and then all the work backwards to the beginning of the movement, because I needed, that was the central part of it. That's what I needed. By the way, what you're hearing, although Stanley did record this commercially, as did Richard Stolzman, uh, for you know, beautifully produced records. This is actually a recording of the world premiere, which is why you hear the coughs. Uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein conducting it, because in many ways that's my favorite. And it may not be the sonic the greatest one, because it was recorded on tape in 1977, but the energy and the character is so great that I'd rather play that for you than the commercial discs of it. Anyway, that ends, and now we're into the last movement. Now, I have all this stuff worked out. I've got that it's going to be a toccata, that it's antiphonal. Now what do I do next? And the answer is, how did I pick material and what did I do to make this work? Well, this is the, the way my thinking went. Let me not use this until the last half of the piece. Let me start here with the idea of motion on the stage. So I can deal with stands moving a single note back and forth. I could deal with this back and forth, timpanis. I could deal with trumpet, talking clarinet, talking to trumpet, clarinet, talking to lower brass on either side. Now, what about my material? What do I use? And I said, well, one of them is I want a toccata. So I made up a toccata. And because I wanted it to be very chromatic, I used the 12-tone method in doing that, which is simply a very simple process of writing, but it can give you an infinite number of notes that are constantly changing. But if you want to sound still like you have a tonality with the 12 tone, all you have to do is repeat some of the notes more often, and you'll start to hear those as the central notes. So I did that combination of things to get an angular, wild toccata.
But I wanted something to oppose that, something that was perhaps just quite the opposite. It's something very tonal. And to do that, I actually looked back on scores of music and Giovanni Gabrielli is 1L or 2L, 1L, isn't it? I don't know. Is that right? I think, yeah, I think that's right. He wrote a, a piece called Sonata Pian Forte. And it was for a mixed ensemble of instruments, including a violin and a trombone, really strange combination. But it was a piece of chamber music. And it was the first piece in musical history. It was, I think, uh, 1597. I'm not 100% sure of all this sort of stuff that this was written. But it was a piece in which, for the first time in the history of music, a composer put down P for soft and F for loud. Before that, there were no dynamics in music. This is going back a long time, of course. So it's a very famous piece. And I looked through a bunch of pieces. And in that piece, I found a very simple progression that sounds very much like Gabrielli and pre-Baroque music. Uh, and it was in G minor. And it was just. So I took that passage that actually goes, and I slowed it down, and I put it in low instruments like four bassoons, three bassoons, and a contrabassoon way here. And then it went like it's going someplace else. And, or I would put it in the whole big brass section near the end of the piece. So I had here a melodic quote of antiphonal music in this antiphonal toccata. The next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to make calls back and forth, like the trumpets call here and the trumpets call there. And that led me to another interesting discovery, which gave me a new way of notating something and thinking about it. The problem with sound over distance is that sound travels very slowly. Light over distance is instantaneous, 186,000 miles per second. Sound goes at 600 and something miles an hour. I don't know what it is exactly. But that means that if you play a note here, it might be a se second or two or more before it reaches the back here. So if you want people to, from here to play together with people over here, and you want them both to play something that sounds like this, you know, have them on the stage playing it and up in the balcony, they cannot play together. The reason is even if they play together, where you are sitting in the hall determines which one you'll hear first. If you're sitting up close to this group, they'll sound first and they will sound last. If you're sitting up there, they will sound first and they will sound last, even if they're together. If you sit in the back of an orchestra sometimes, up way in the back, and you see a conductor go like this, and then you hear the music after it, that's because the music started when he did that, but it didn't reach you till then. So how am I going to write fanfares and calls with instruments that are so far away? And I thought about it, and that led me to, again, a musical answer, which is, how about fanfares that cannot be aligned, that cannot, are not meant to align, like da 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 is meant to align. But what I ended up writing, and I used this notation then from then on, is I said, well, if I write a fanfare and I go like this, Okay, that means I play those that note sixteenth notes for that value. Okay, da 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 like that. But if I write another notation and just say I'm writing it like this, and then I put a little asterisk, and then I say play like fast Morse code. Okay, so the jagged lines mean that you play that fast as in Morse code. In other words, you go like this. And then the other person goes. Now you can go back and forth because those two can't synchronize. They're not supposed to. So the fanfares here that start happening between these groups are all made out of jagged, pulsing fanfares. And that gave me, so now I have fanfares, I have Gabrielli, I have an antiphonal 
toccata, all of these elements. And I built the piece from these elements. Let me, let me just put them down so we can look at them closely later. So what I have is, I have um, Gabrielli. I have fanfares, and I'll put with that way. I have 12 tone. OK? Now, it's in three sections, this piece, OK? This movement. One is the toccata. Two is the beginning of the central section is the um, use of the Gabrielli in slow motion against the offstage people, and three comes back to the toccata. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play the last movement for you, and what I'm going to do is point to when things are happening here, because you can't possibly hear the surround quality and who's playing what on a stereo recording. That's a 5.1 you need for this. And there is no 5.1 recording of this at the moment. So let me play it for you and I will show you when things are moving, how they're moving. We'll see if these speakers are really left and right because if they're left and right it should start from here and go to here. But if somebody reverses the plugs it'll go the other way. <laughs> so I don't know what will happen until we hear it. So here we go.